saying we are devoted to lifelong learning. Uh, some could even say that we're wonky. So I think it's especially appropriate that we have as our fourth distinguished speaker a architectural and art historian and a professor at Columbia. And that alone would make Carol Willis a welcome participant. But Carol is also the author of an acclaimed book. I love the title, Form Follows Finance, Skyscrapers and Skylines in New York City and also Chicago. And Carol, you may not know, but it is anticipated that next year, the largest cities in the US will be New York, LA, Brooklyn, and then Chicago. <laughs> but it gets even That's better. 1998. <laughs> Carol founded a museum. So how cool is that? Mm -hmm. So please join me in welcoming Carol Willis, who is the founder, director, and curator of the Skyscraper Museum. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Maris Marisa and Anita and Edith, who I've known since uh, she was a student at Columbia, uh, and, and all of you for being here. It's really a total delight to be speaking with you because I've been working on zoning for a very long time, and I will show you in the course of my slides. Uh, these are a little disoriented because I know there's slides back there, and I can see, as, uh, I will be able to see my slides up here. Um, as soon as I find the clicker, yes, um, but that's not the first slide. Uh, to talk to you about a topic that I've been working on uh, since I'm delighted to say looking around at so many young people, uh, young planners in the audience for probably longer than you've been alive <laughs> because you'll see my first article about zoning, Zoning and Zeitgeist, I published in 1986. So who was born, uh, not yet born in 1986? Anybody? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so <laughs> there's a lot that will be new to, uh, to uh, a lot of you. Uh, uh, but I hope that there's going to be something that's new to everybody here, because the idea of the history and the origins, the surprising, surprising origins of FAR, certainly surprised me for all of the years that I've been working on this topic. And I've asked many people, uh, well, where, FAR, where did that come from? And most people will say, oh, you know, feeling very confident in their uh, expertise in land use law or being a former uh, commissioner or a, uh, a, a uh, chairman of the City Planning Commission. I've asked at least three people uh, that same question, or teaching land loose use law. I've asked uh, people who, with that profile, well, where did FAR come from anyway? And they said, well, you know, 1961, the 1961 law. Uh, and I said, well, no, before that. And I said, well, the 1916 law, is that where it came from? And the answer to that is absolutely no, <laughs> because it's, the 1916 law is the opposite of FAR, and that's part of what I want to you know, unpack for you today through a series um, of images. So um, the way that I came to this topic, not the topic of zoning that goes way back to being an architectural historian, and my discipline is art history. Uh, <laughs> art history with a specialty in architectural history. So I'm not an architect. I'm definitely not a planner. Uh, and most of what I've done in my career as an art historian is to look at American architecture of the 1920s and 30s, the American city, urban history, um, I'd like to think uh, broadly, but mostly through the lens of commercial architecture and the skyscraper. Uh, and this time for an exhibition, Housing Density from Tenements from tenements to towers um, that I invite you to, see, to come and see at the Skyscraper Museum. Please say that you're from city planning, you're connected to city planning. We'll give you free admission in order to come to the museum anytime Wednesday through Sunday from noon to six. Um, we'll direct the admissions desk to say, please come in, bring a guest or whatever. We want you to be able to see this show because housing density and from tenements to towers is the place that we, that, um, we found the um, uh, the idea of housing reforming zoning, the subtitle of how housing reformed zoning uh, in the, with the 1961 law. So um, the exhibition, actually I need to talk about the, the um, image, the 
overview image of this landscape of New York, um, looking down the Lower East Side towards the skyscrapers of the financial district, the um, center of capitalism, the density of concentration of capitalism that is the, uh, that is the financial district and Wall Street. Uh, and then this broad swath, this low, ri low uh, rise area of tenements that in this photograph of 1956 is being reformed by pub the public housing movement. And so all the projects that you see that are already built, like Vladic houses um, and the East River houses, and um, the ones farther in the background that are in just in the, the process of being built, is the transformation um, and from the 1930s through the 1960s, not even the post-war landscape of New York, all this is a 1956 uh, photograph. Uh, and you can see how dramatically the two capitalisms of New York's built environment uh, in, uh, by 1900 and the, and the 1920s, the commercial architecture of skyscrapers, but also the immigrant entrepreneurial investment in tenement building, that was the Lower East Side are transformed by a movement where um, land is, not, is no longer privately owned, but taken, bought back in order to build public housing. And it's that context that we, we explored in the exhibition, Housing Density, and I have to give um, credit especially to my guest curators, uh, and uh, who are Nicholas Bloom, who uh, couldn't be here today, but is a professor now at Hunter College. But at the time that we, about two years ago, that we started this exhibition was at New York Institute of Technology. And he worked with his uh, colleague there, an architect, Matt Altwicker, and the students of NYIT to make the models that you will see in the um, exhibition here, uh, the tables and the models and all of the, the uh, individual building models and these district models that we'll look at in some um, additional in overview detail here. Uh, and Nick uh, would, allowed me, uh, as a, a great expert on public housing, he wrote, among other uh, books, Public Housing That Worked, about the history of NYCHA. And Nick knows absolutely everything there is to know about public housing, not just in New York, but across the country, and, but especially in New York. So that the questions that we wanted to bring to the topic of density, because we wanted to celebrate density in the exhibition, uh, but we also wanted to examine it and examine its history and the reforms of density of tenement life to the um, what turns out to be the very low density of NYCHA housing and public housing, uh, and how that trajectory happened over time. Uh, so uh, in addition to Matt and uh, Nick working on, as the, uh, the, co, the guest co-curators of the exhibition, uh, my own staff, jo Josh Vogel and uh, Leo Tamargo, uh, a student who was working for us, who was also an architect and a student at Columbia in the critical and curatorial studies and did all the, um, the graphics that you'll see uh, in the exhibition and in the analysis here today. So one of the things I want you to look at in the um, view, this is hard, hard to do, uh, are on the two tables, and because this one is so discolored, but I think you can see them better, uh, over, better color over there, the um, yellow background, for the housing that you see here uh, is housing that is on, on land, super blocks in this case, uh, public housing or publicly assisted housing that it was underzoned. Uh, and if it's orange, as you can see in, uh, you can't really see it because everything's kind of orange here, London Terrace, uh, there it is, London Terrace there, orange, uh, the, the buildings are overbuilt according to what housing would allow um, today. Uh, but it's important to note that all of this housing was built be, um, before zoning affected uh, the shapes or the, the, the heights um, of housing because the history of housing in New York is a history of code control and ten, um, tenement law uh, and height caps that begins in 1885. Uh, we know mostly the, the new law tenement uh, um, constraints uh, and a whole series of uh, of code um, kind of overlays that are that that cap the heights and therefore make housing below what zoning would allow if there was zoning to control it. Now this is all very complicated, and I just want to take credit with this um, graphic that we made for the exhibition, which was the very it's the last panel of the show. 
it is, um, uh, if you can see it, it's, it's right there. It's back in that corner. And this panel, which is uh, way too difficult to read and has like 2,000 words on it, was the way of us saying, OK, we said that. You know, we got this in here. Copyright, this is our idea. Uh, and, and so this lecture is really about that panel and trying to take apart all of those pieces. And I'll come back to it later. So it was enormously important um, for, um, for the thinking about zoning, um, my, the kind of evolution of my thinking about zoning, because I was, thought I knew a lot about the 1920s, the 1916 zoning law, and then its impact in the 1920s, because I'd written a lot about that. But I didn't know um, very much about 1961. And, uh, and I kept grappling with the issue of how did what were the forces that affected zoning and changed things? And then I began to realize after a year's work of work with Nick that zoning had very little to do with this. But then we began to see this pattern. Um, and the, the pattern emerges from looking at zoning through the lens of housing rather than through the ends of property rights and the, and the regulation of, of, of bulk and built form, which is the story of 1916. Um, so working backwards, uh, from uh, in time, my most recent uh, lecture to uh, for I guess the city planning commission was for this conference in 2011 zoning in the city, which celebrated the 75th anniversary um, of the no this one was the 50th anniversary of the 1961 law, um, and for that I um, gave a talk called the 19. Uh, 1961 zoning resolution, three little words. And those three little words are floor area ratio, FAR. And for that talk, um, I talked mostly about the impact of uh, the zoning law on the central city, the commercial architecture, the skyscrapers like the, as they were called, the XYZ buildings on 6th Avenue because they were so indistinguishable from, from one another, um, and the bonus plazas and the form of the tower in the plaza that evolved as one aspect of the reforms of the 1961 zoning law. Uh, my talks to the city planning um, commission or for them at a conference back in 1992, this one, Planning and Zoning New York City, uh, was convened for the 75th anniversary of the 1916 zoning law. Uh, and this publication um, came out of that event. I, uh, in the last uh, few days, I looked back at, some, at not just my, here's my, um, my article in, in the book and the paper that I gave that day, uh, but as some of the other articles and then the discussion afterwards. And if there's time, I'd like to read from some of that because I think that the narrative that in the discussion of planners like Sid Grava um, and uh, historians and architects like uh, Bob Stern and Norman Marcus and a bunch of people who were extremely uh, familiar with having written aspects of the zoning law, uh, there was a, a very informed discussion. But I think, uh, and, and also Richard Pluntz, who had a um, water emergency this morning and so isn't here in order for him to receive my praise, uh, to say that of all of the people, he was the one who identified the role of density City and zoning uh, and down zoning through the lens of housing, no surprise, since he wrote the history of housing in New York, uh, his masterwork. Uh, and he was, he was the one person who really identified how housing was on the agenda of the 1961 zoning law. Now, that won't surprise most of you who are planners, but if you're in the field of art history and architectural history, it's not anything that anybody has ever talked about. Um, so in the article about uh, uh, 3D CBD, I focused again on the skyscraper. And here we are in the basement of 120 Broadway, um, right there, obviously. Everybody knows this. Uh, a, a building that was really You burned it out already. <laughs> okay. Right. Try to handle it. Whole thing. Oh, I'm not good at that. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, I'll do it. I'll do this while you get me a battery, if that's okay. Because um, then I have to do two things with my hands. Um, so uh, it was the crowding that's e easily evidenced in this uh, image of uh, crowded Broadway uh, that um, was the. Uh, instigation for regulating uh, height and bulk of buildings. And uh, the particulars of that, you can see in some of the diagrams that were created for the 1916 law. These are, um, are easy to find um, in Foreign Follows Finance and in this uh, article. Um, uh, and uh, there were five formulas. There was uh, the regulation of bulk according to a setback formula for taller buildings, for high-rise buildings that set back within the angle of light that you can see in the, in the image. And um, other representations of that idea emphasize in black the bulk of the building, the angle. Um, the, by which they need to set back, and that angle is the angle for sunlight. Uh, the zoning law of 1916, of course, shaped buildings directly, uh, and it shaped the city and the skyline. Um, and some examples of that, uh, you can see easily how the zoning law, depending on the size of your lot, uh, produced a shorter building that you can see on the um, right-hand side, and uh, the taller 70 Pine Street that you see on the left, which, uh, had, which illustrates an important feature of the 1916 law, that you were allowed to put a tower over a quarter of the site to unlimited height. And the, the limit on height was the economic height of the building, uh, not the en engineering height, which could have been taller. But based on the size of the lot, you had, a setback, you had to use the setback formula, but then you could build a tall tower. So under the 1916 law, for very large sites, towers were virtually unlimited. Uh, and so that the shape of the city that emerged uh, in the 1920s under the uh, regulation of the zoning law that you see in lower Manhattan or you begin to see in, in Midtown, takes the shape of these ziggurat towers. Uh, and if they're on large sites with a, with a slender tower um, that rises over 25% of the lot. So, um, so you could see that in the city. Uh, and here's my article of uh, back when I was at Parsons School of Design uh, in 1986, before a lot of you were born. On, uh, and I love alliteration. So this is one of my favorite titles ever, Zoning and Zeitgeist, uh, the skyscraper city in the 1920s. And in that, I argued uh, that zoning, of course, the reality of zoning was the thing that shaped buildings. And you can see that uh, in, in all of the photographs that uh, that I, that I showed um, before. But the thing that really changed the minds of architects was the imagery, uh, and this is a series of drawings that, that uh, the architectural delineator Hugh Ferris did in 1922 and were widely published uh, in the New York Times and shown at the exhibition of the Architectural League of New York and went on tour across the country and were remarked upon, and this is what the article is about, the images of 1922, which is long before any the buildings that you saw, you know, that were built from about 1926 and 27 on of the Lower Manhattan skyline, um, that, that these images were remarked upon by the architects of the day, like Ralph Walker um, and Eli Jacques Hahn and Raymond Hood, saying, these, the, the power of these images, which were so minimalist, so stripped down, so sculptural in the form, so monumental in the buildings, were the things that showed the architects what modernism might be in New York. So that um, when you look at the 1920s and the Art, Great Art Deco Towers, they're highly decorated. But the idea of the formal power of these buildings is something that was communicated through drawings. Um, and so, um, uh, I have to put in a plug for my profession of, of art, uh, art history, because long before the internet, art historians knew that images have power, and images have power to survive in a way that um, texts and planning reports, unillustrated planning reports, um, I'm afraid do not. Uh, and and it, the power of the image to communicate um, is something that we have to appreciate and look at in uh, it. Um, in history, and we can read those those images as text, and that's part of what I want to do in order to make um, the argument today. So um, the peop the person who made the original drawings that I showed you, and ones that look like this, 
uh, of uh, the wireframe drawings of the zoning diagram uh, was no Hugh Ferris, and I don't know that he's even the one who made the, the, the drawings, it was probably somebody else, but it's George B. Ford, uh, and some of you may know his name because he was a famous planner and he wrote uh, the regulations for height and bulk. He was on the committee in 1913 that drafted the regulations, so he was there. He was making the rules. Um, he was making the formulas, and he was making the drawings, um, and the drawings which had um, not very much power to communicate in the way that Hugh Ferris's transformed architect's understanding about what the zoning law could be for architecture and for the city. Um, I won't go into the longer uh, argument about Hugh Ferris, uh, um, but some of you may know his famous book, The Metropolis of Tomorrow, where he envisions a future city, which is really evolves out of the New York City zoning law. So here are these wireframe drawings that really had not very much power to communicate. Um, and, uh, and we, I know George B. Ford's name, but not the world doesn't know George B. Ford's name. Uh, and we don't know the name of the person who made these drawings either. This is the first drawing, as far as we can tell it was published, of um, floor area ratio uh, from the 1950 report Rezoning New York by Harrison Ballard and, and Allen. Uh, and they're not powerful drawings. They're no, they're no Hugh Ferris drawings, right? They don't capture your imagination. Um, and you can only find them on one of the far um, interior pages of the report. Uh, so, so this drawing and the thinking about uh, FAR, well, it's just a form isn't it? You know, there's not much to it, uh, is what I want to examine today because I want to look at the precepts, um, not the particulars of zoning, not the formula part of it, but the ideas that motivated it. And certainly the, the narrative that I've already suggested of uh, the skyscraper city of, uh, of, of lower Manhattan, um, the images of capitalism, the concentration on Wall Street, and the need to regulate that shape um, is something that is obviously uh, uh, um, produced by the forces of capitalism, right? And so constraining those forces or regulating them just enough in order to make those skyscrapers still profitable and to protect the property rights of the people um, of the adjacent buildings is the thing that concerned the urban reformers um, and then the powers that be, the, um, the uh, politicians um, and people in power who did pass the 1916 zoning law. Uh, so the narrative of moneyed interests is the way that I agree the 1916 zoning law should be interpreted. Um, but it's the, the new idea of, um, of FAR and of limiting the, the, the bulk by virtue of limiting the, the floor area um, that I want to explain that, that evolution. Uh, and as you can see from this 1951 uh, uh, article in uh, the American City, the idea of doing that, the striking innovation of the zoning um, that wouldn't be passed until 1961. There's a, this is 11 years before the 1961 zoning was actually passed and there'll be another consultant in between. Uh, but the idea of FAR appears in the report in 1950 that I'll show you in some more detail, uh, and, uh, and it was considered to be entirely new at the time. All right, now, okay, I, I'm, so I'm not going to read the part that I intended to read um, here uh, because I can't hold this and read, I suppose, at the same time. Well, maybe I could, but um, I think I've already talked through the kind of uh, basic ideas that the origins of FAR are not well known uh, by people who have studied it over the years. Uh, and the um, the evolution from 1961 has to go at least to 1950, uh, and you can see that in the cover of the report uh, by, as you see, Harrison, Ballard, and Allen. And I'm going to push it, I'm going to illustrate that for you, and then I'm going to push it back even farther, because um, in order to find the origins of this report, you have to look at public housing in the 1930s, and especially the work um, of uh, Frederick Ackerman, who headed the technical division of NYCHA, um, and the architects that served under him, 
them and then the first large scale master planned apartment communities uh, in the United States that formed the model not just uh, in the 1930s for the 1950s, um, 40s, 50s, and 60s, so the post-war era of urban renewal, um, but also for this, the uh, large scale housing across the United States. So the, the interior cover, or the, the, the title page of a plan for rezoning New York, you can see, and I'll show it to you again, um, includes both housing and commercial architecture. And I just want to call attention, uh, given the date, that the image of Lever House that you see there in a model, Lever House isn't built yet. Right? This is 1950, and it'll be built in 1952. So, so the idea and the narrative that you hear about the 1961 zoning law is the, uh, uh, the, the tower in the park solution solution or the tower in the plaza solution is something that comes as a result of uh, Lever House and the Seagram building and the One Chase Manhattan Plaza, which is always the way that you hear this, and I've said many, many times myself in, in, um, in uh, uh, history lectures, uh, those buildings didn't exist yet uh, in 1950 when this, this idea of FAR is being propounded. So we're going to talk about FAR precepts, uh, but not the particulars uh, of the formula, not FAR as a formula, but as an idea, and where did that idea come from? So the critique that is articulated of the 1916 zoning law in the 1950 report by, and I'm going to just call this Ballard's report, although he's working with um, not just uh, his partners, but with a whole um, host of 13 committees who are coming up, technical committees that came up with their reports, but I'm just going to call it Ballard because I want to trace these ideas back to the 1930s. Um, the, the critique is the bulk that was allowed by 19, six, the 1916 zoning, um, what they called the monstrous uh, bulk, um, actually in the, the next slide after this. Uh, the graphics that illustrated these in the next pages uh, of the report show together the city plan, the current uh, building, and the present permitted envelope. Uh, the ideal that they um, did admire and wanted to reproduce was a Rockefeller Center which um, I think you can, I can barely see there is uh, just under 12 FAR, not the 30 FAR uh, that w is the equivalent uh, for, let's say, the Empire State Building. Uh, and they wanted to critique, as you can see in the lower right, the permitted envelope. One is by multiple ownership, but the one where um, the most bulk is put on the site is if you own the entire lot, um, as you would have if you had um, uh, all of the three blocks of Rockefeller Center. So this is the... Um, this is the, the housing version of that, and, and under permitted development, they talk about the monstrous bulk that was allowed by the 1916 zoning law. Now, um, because they wanted to reform that monstrous bulk, they needed to come up with a formula by which they could translate the bulk into floor area, uh, and they and the the. Uh, you could do that by just slicing bulk into, like if bulk was a loaf of bread, you could, so in, a, in a triangular shape, let's say, or pyramidal shape, you could slice it into a lot of different um, slices and get floor area out of that. So it's easy to, to say, oh, you know, what's the slab to slab height of a floor, and then how many square feet could you, um, could, could you build on a site? And this is exactly the process they did use, but they wanted to figure out how many square feet they needed, not how many they could have. So first they had to figure out how many they could have, then they had to figure out how many they would need for the future city, and that's what these graphics are about, um, because they were, they were literally planning. They were um, extrapolating from a 1940s census a 1970s need for an increased population. And while there are a number of different graphics that we, we could use, you can see some of the ones down there. They used a family unit uh, in order to multiply, and they, and they used flo uh, residential floor space to be the, the principal determinant because commercial space was so um, enormously uh, over, uh, over ascribed in, in, in what you were allowed to build. So, <clears throat> so we're going to, um, hmm. Water? 
I guess I'm still gonna have to hold this microphone with no battery, we'll see. We, um, we are gonna shift the focus backwards from the 1950s back to the 1930s um, to, uh, well, a, a, a principal person uh, in the movement of housing reform from the 1910s on. And uh, the picture you see here is of Frederick Ackerman, who became in 1934 when NYCHA was established, the technical the head of the technical division of NYCHA. Uh, and uh, he had a long history in housing and planning and in critiquing uh, house, uh, tenement house housing in particular, uh, but also city planning uh, through uh, a series of of reports uh, that he wrote for the Journal of the AIA for when he, when he worked for the Secretary of the Navy during World War I. He studied uh, in England the system of providing Garden City housing, and he was by 1923 one of the um, kind of founding principals of the Regional Plan Association of America, who are basically decentralists. Um, he, I will mention some of the other things that he did. Um, later as we profile him a little bit more, but we want to stay on the topic of how did they turn bulk into floor area. Uh, and uh, to find the origins of that idea, to look back to the very first years of NYCHA. So um, in this report, which is basically a typescript, we happened to find it in Avery Library. Um, and you know, thank you Google search and, and Google book, book search. The scholarship that I did back in the 1980s was, well, may have been informed by luck in certain cases, and but certainly by Avery Library, where in the system where you would take a book off of the shelf, there would be the related books right next to it on the topic, and so you could look at those, you know, in a physical space. Um, but, but Google has expedited all of these, uh, these searches, uh, and we came across this one digitized in Avery Library, so we went and took pictures of it in, a in Avery Library. But as you can maybe see, um, I'm sure you can't see that from back there, or maybe over here, um, it's the population of New York City um, as permitted in the zoning and multiple dwelling law. And I didn't talk about the multiple dwelling law. It's probably not worth going into it at this point. Um, but this is uh, December 1934, and you see the two authors are um, Frederick Ackerman, the technical director, and um, the young Princeton Architecture School graduate who had just signed on at NYCHA, um, William um, uh, Ballard, um, Bill Ballard, uh, who was assistant and gets the co credit on this and another important um, uh, study that we'll see in a minute. So, well, there's Ballard. Um, he went on, as you can see, in 1963 to be ch uh, become chairman of the Planning Commission, 1965, 63 to 65. Uh, and we we're just looking at the picture of him there um, as an adult, but he's in this uh, picture. <laughs> Right there, we think we think that that's Ballard right there, and these are in the NYCHA archives. Looks looks a lot like him, and he was the architect of record for Queensbridge, um, which is the model that they're looking at right there. Oh, oh excellent, thank you. Because I'm not. <laughs> so I'm sure you're in. Well, is it turned on? Yeah? OK, great. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're marveling in all of the calculation that, that you can see here. Is a zoning survey of New York in um, 1934. This, these are the inside pages. And I'll show you the drawings, the wireframe um, uninspirational drawings, but so important for their analysis. Um, you, can, you can see all of these tabulations, really these obsessive tabulations are really characteristic of Ackerman, and I'll show you some others um, later, uh, and I'll try to explain why. But here's some of the drawings they did for the zoning um, survey, multiple dwellings, uh, where they analyzed the full block up there, and then the kind of massing that was allowed by multiple dwellings. And there's another one here. And what they were doing was um, critiquing the amount of bulk that was allowed and then putting it in that, uh, that, that chart of like tw uh, 1,200 different units and characteristics uh, in order to come up with what is the total population density permitted by law. Um, this, this particular uh, representation in bar graphs uh, by uh, Burroughs uh, is shown in persons per gross acre, which is very relevant to uh, NYCHA at the time. 
by the way, zoning is not relevant to NYCHA in any way at the time, right? And zoning has nothing to do with anything what NYCHA was, done, was doing, but they were interested in it. They were keenly interested in it because what they wanted to do was to plan a city to, um, to lower density, um, to create a new shape of the city, a new future city through an analysis um, of uh, what, what would be the right size city for the future using housing um, as, the, as the model. Uh, and um, this happens to be the document that explains as kind of the cliff notes to the 1961 zoning that was created by the City Planning Commission um, as a graphic doc, you know, 50 page, I think 56 page document. Um, f uh, back in, in 1960, so yet another uh, uh, consultant has come into the, uh, into, into the story by them, but you can see the idea is the same in 1934 and 1960. Same idea, exact same analysis, same numbers. They're the same numbers that they used in um, 1961. And, uh, um, so here's what the population zone capacity um, is, the top, and here's what they need. So here's what um, zoning would allow in, uh, in 1960, uh, and here's what they would need in 1970. Um, and, uh, and the zoning law was reduced by that amount. So um, Ackerman, and I'll show you this same image before, is a man um, who is, I think I say it here, ubiquitous and also anonymous. He's not completely anonymous because if you do Google searches on Ackerman, you will come up with a lot of different returns because his name was on every project and right, rightly so um, because just to name a few of the, uh, the, the, the projects that he was involved in you know, after war housing in World War I when he was already active as the head of that the unit for I think the Navy. Um, to create workers' housing, uh, he became involved in the uh, public housing movement. Well, he was, he was one of the architects on Sunnyside. He was one of the architects for Radburn. He was uh, the architect for in, in charge, the signing off, and under uh, his, uh, his um, authority uh, for first houses. Uh, uh, he was uh, the head with NYCHA of Williamsburg houses. So he, his name is everywhere. He had a fingerprint on practically every aspect of the housing movement from the 19 teens on. Um, but, there, but his face is not very many places. That picture that I showed you is from, I, I found it at the previous one with, the, uh, with the, the plans in the back, is from Sunnyside Gardens' website, and I don't even know what the source is. We tried to find out. Here's one more picture. I know one other picture of Ackerman. So um, in the same way that George B. Ford is not known to history, even though he drew the diagrams that, that, that created the template by which all of the great skyscrapers of the 1920s were created, really until 1961, but let's take the great Art Deco skyscrapers of New York of the 1920s. You could say that George B. Ford was the architect of those, of those buildings because he created the template and, and you could say that the architects decorated them. Um, so uh, the... FAR has a little more latitude to play when that was very intentional. Uh, but if we go back to what were the precepts where they figure out what is the number, what are the numbers that we're going to give to FAR, um, I think that we need to go back and, and, um, and locate the origins of that paternity um, to Frederick Ackerman. So his face uh, is practically nowhere. He's anonymous, but he is ubiquitous. Um, these are the drawings that are made under uh, his uh, direction by NYCHA, and their analysis, these were used in the Museum of Modern Art exhibition on housing, modern housing, back in 1932 um, uh, or 30, 33. Um, he was already a, a part of, uh, of committees then, um, along with his uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Clarence Stein and Henry Wright, uh, Lewis Mumford, who was a little bit more um, contentious uh, with Ackerman, uh, but they were all friends together uh, and worked together on the Regional Plan Association at, at uh, Sunnyside and Radburn as well. Um, but Ackerman had this, uh, oh, back to the image, um, uh, philosophy of technocracy, 
uh, that was a, he, that he wrote about here in one of the in short-lived magazine uh, technocracy. Uh, but his his interests go back to Thorsten Veblen in the, in the 19 teens, uh, and he was the most devoted mum Mumford said of of, uh, of Ackerman. He was the most persistent and devoted um, uh, disciple that that Veblen ever had. And if uh, we anybody knows anything. Uh, uh, any, anybody who knows one fact about Veblen uh, today knows theory of the leisure class, right? And that's the only thing we, um, that most people know about him, certainly the only thing I really knew about him before I started into this uh, route. Um, Veblen is very difficult to read. And Ackerman, as voluminous as his writings are, are very difficult to read. I'll give you a sample of some of them later. But his writings are everywhere. But his graphics, his graphics are the thing that attracted um, uh, Leo Tamargo and I to his uh, his work and to explore especially this important uh, study that they did for night shows published um, by Ackerman and Ballard, um, the two co-authors co in 1937, a note on site and unit planning. And as you can see from some of the um, sample images, um, he is concerned with the placement on the site of the housing and in the lower image, comparative sunlight chart. As important as um, the units per acre uh, in the NYCHA housing was the amount of open space and the sunlight um, that penetrated into the site. And I want to emphasize that because it continues into the 1961 um, housing, the housing reforms zoning idea. NYCHA, um, Ackerman's diagrams for NYCHA um, show you a series of distributions, and here you can see his fixation on numbers, um, and people commented, I mean, he was almost autistically uh, focused on a uh, kind of idiot savant of numbers and, t and tabulations, and he had this this uh, stable of architects who would calculate all these things for them, whether it was the, the number of, of feet that, that existed in all of the zoning, all of the blocks and all of the zoning lots under 1916, which was what that other big chart was about, to hear different ways to apportion people on the site um, for NYCHA housing, and this is before any NYCHA housing was actually finished. Um, and the range of density, and this is uh, people per acre, people gross, uh, per gross acre, is 100 density up to um, the highest density is 250 people per acre. That's not a lot of people per acre, and it's a lot less um, than, um, than we explored in the exhibition um, analysis of different housing pro projects, both public and private. Uh, so I'm going to accelerate a little bit because I'm seeing I'm getting late, not surprisingly. Um, we can see in the image of Queensbridge, um, the sign, sign below, William Ballard, chief architect for Queensbridge. Um, he was chief architect for, he led the teams for a lot of uh, public housing and the disposition of the, um, of the, the buildings on, on the site, their, their shapes, their um, site distribution. Uh, Polo Grounds was one um, after he went back into private practice that he was also the architect for. So everything from the first tenement house reforms to the tallest of the towers in the park, he was the architect, um, chief architect for. Um, and I show you this particular image not to, uh, to talk about the units per se, but to show you the chart and the chap tabulation and the graphics. Because one of the things that was happening at the same time with the ubiquity of Frederick Ackerman in affecting everything about architecture and housing um, in, um, in uh, New York uh, at the, during the 1920s and 30s, um, one of the things um, that he was also responsible for was um, architectural graphic standards. And that drawing um, is the same sort of block arrangement um, and detailing that, one, that every architect still learns today. Um, how many are architects and have used uh, architectural graphic standards in your, yeah, so not that many architects here, surprisingly, but you will recognize the same conventions of, of drawing. So um, the authors of architectural graphic standards are um, Charles Ramsey and Harold Sleeper. They were employees of Frederick Ackerman working in his office, paid by Frederick Ackerman in his architectural office, not in the, his NYCHA office, which was also simultaneous. Uh, and, uh, and Ackerman wrote the introduction to the first three editions of architectural graphic standards. So he, 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 he's the one who, who made possible architectural graphic standards, but he didn't sign his name to it. He is not the author of it, because these are, this is not 
architectural design. These are graphic standards. This is the trade of architecture and representation. And this, is, this was the way, it was actually the politics of, of Frederick Ackerman. Um, and it's just interesting to note that, the, that plate one of architectural graphic standards has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the book, right? It's got, if you get, the rest of the book is ultra rational. Um, and, and, and like, you know, without but without personality, drained of personality of representation. And yet here's this kind of cosmic sense about sunlight, which is the orientation chart, and there's a little house in the in the very middle of it. And the signs of the zodiac. I mean it just makes no sense that it's in this book. And yet it's plate one. And that is to, t is to signal how important sunlight was in, the, in their ideas about architecture. Um, and by the time they finished some of these projects, quite a few of the, of the first NYCHA projects, um, this is from uh, a European edition of the New York Times. We, we, we bought one on eBay and we put it in the exhibition from 1940. And you can see the title that they wanted to communicate about these NYCHA projects, New Places in the Sun. That's what they're about. So um, for the exhibition, and we have a whole wall of this, uh, we wanted to take apart the idea of density in public housing and privately developed housing. Uh, in uh, NYCHA projects um, in, in New York from the 19, um, uh, well, we, so we, we have tenements, so we'll see in a moment, um, through, uh, so 1900 uh, versus 1930s. And if we just line up the NYCHA projects that we analyze, you can see Queensbridge houses, Taft houses in the post-war period and the polo grounds uh, by, by Ballard. And you can see that consistently, the, um, the uh, density that's represented, I think, in, in Leo's brilliant uh, kind of summary of the two kinds of density, the population density, which are consistent. This is the original. It's less today in white. But the original is about 249 people an acre. Um, Taft houses, post-war, 237 people an acre. That's today. Uh, but that's what was intended. Uh, and Polo Grounds, about 260. NYCHA projects never have more than 250, 275 people per acre. NYCHA projects are extraordinarily low density in their population. Why? Frederick Ackerman. You can see that his, his studies about density, the, density, the studies about density that are based on how much space can you build in New York now with the monstrous volume that's allowed by the 1916 law. If we say, what's the right size of the city? How many people will there be in 1970? How much space does each family need? Let's get, let's put those together. How much space they need in 19, how many people there be in 1970? How much space they'll need? And we'll down the zone in the city by that much. And that is what happened in 1961. Um, but, but NYCHA housing never goes more than about 275 people an acre, intended with each project as it's developed. So, um, so NYCHA is low density. It's low density not just in people per acre, but in land coverage, right? Because NYCHA housing is never more than 20, it's the, um, Queensbridge is the, the most, 26% built, co built coverage, right? 74% open space is usually more than that. So NYCHA is low density on both counts, built density and population density. Um, and if you want to contrast that with some of the diagrams that we did, most dense place in the world in the Lower East Side um, was the Lower East Side in about 1900. There were about 1,100 people per acre in the most dense of the tenement blocks. Um, and some of those reforms uh, that made lower density by the private market model. Um, we're looking uh, in uh, Queens, in Jackson Heights. Here we're looking at London Terrace, as we do in the exhibition, uh, or of Knickerbocker Village um, on the Lower East Side, and, and uh, developed as an idea by Fred French in the private market. But uh, when the crash came, he couldn't put enough financing together. So it was the first publicly financed um, housing project by the federal government. And who was in charge of overseeing that? Frederick Ackerman. All right, so you can see that the private model is much, uh, is much more dense than the public or publicly assisted. Uh, and when you come to the exhibition, you'll see Penn South, et cetera. Uh, so um, as part of zoning as it is 
uh, you know, written into law in 1961 and recommended back in 1930s by, uh, by Ackerman and Ballard, um, you see the emphasis on open space. And so this, again, is the 1960 report. I just want to make that linkage from the 30s to the 60s and the precepts, precepts not the particulars of, of, um, <coughs> of how zoning was um, formulized. This is on your website. This is my uh, this is my favorite cover. There were there was a second printing for the plan of rezoning New York, and you see the um, name of uh, oops Harrison Ballard uh, and Allen right there. Um, this is a different color version of it. And the the point about the the cover um, is really not the point about the book because you see you see that the graphics are telling you that they're changing the setback formula um, to one of a tower with a setback and, and more open space and, and uh, in this case more restricted. Uh, and there you see again the same point that I made about Leverhouse not being there yet, but in 1950 um, the um, Equally important for the plan of rezoning New York, um, and more so even than a, than a new kind of skyscraper, were the housing projects, the large-scale housing projects. And of course, NYCHA was the model um, for all large-scale housing projects in the city. Uh, so what were the objectives that they wrote about? OK, I'm really going to go fast through these. But um, so this is page one of you know, what, what, is the, what is the new zoning law supposed to be about? So even though this is not the, the consultant's report that actually passed um, in 1961, in 1950 it set out the same ideas that, were, that, that carried across the next decade and were finally implemented. So if we got closer, we see the objectives are for um, overhauling um, the 1916 zoning. Uh, and the paragraph two is what I see as the most important part, the reduction in permitted bulk and density to far below the present figures of approximately 70 million residential. That was in the bar graph that you saw before, the 70 million. And a working population of 320 million working, working population. Obviously, we didn't need that many, that much space. So, you know, so what are we going to do instead, bottom of, the, of, uh, pay, of paragraph uh, three, um, to... Uh, to to adjust the land available for residence um, purposes in a matter providing increased light, air, and usable open space. This is the mantra of NYCHA um, appearing in, the, in the, the words of Ballard and the other consultants in 1950. Um, and you saw this before. This is what they were trying to avoid. This is how they um, criticized the bulk, and they turned it into the sliced bread of floor area. Um, and then they, um, they, they downzoned in the bar graph uh, by that amount of space. So in between Ballard and the, the um, passage of the law is another uh, set of, of consultants, Voorhees, Walker, um, Smith, and, and Smith. Uh, zoning New York instead of rezoning New York as a title. These titles get really confusing when you have to no uh, note them. Um, and you can see um, that what I focused on when I was first coming to the zone zoning law was Lever House, which is built by this time in the 1960, like 1959, this report. Um, and the revisions uh, to tall buildings and the amount of space they'd be allowed to put on the site, you can see in a Hugh Ferris rendering that shows you what you would be allowed to build in 1916 in the center, and then how little, relatively, you'll be able to build under the 1961 um, re zoning reforms. Uh, and so here it's called, again, rezoning New York City. So that's confusing, but this is the 19... Um, the 60 report that was released by the Department of City Planning. And you can see they spend a lot of time explaining floor area ratio. This is, again, the, the short pamphlet. Um, and they have very helpful graphics um, to help the general public um, consume uh, and understand this new principle that will be put into place. Uh, they also have the, their um, rhetoric uh, lined up about regulating intensity of residential development. Uh, and they favored that so much and make the argument about open space, which is the key to desirable neighborhoods. And uh, here, Fresh Meadows is, is already built. Um, and a number of other large-scale projects like this um, have been built around the city. Uh, and they want to encourage more of that. So they're going to give, and this is bonuses for open space, not Tower and a Plaza with the extra FAR for uh, office space. This is, these are, this is bonus for a recommended bonus for um, residential buildings, right? Bonuses for open space. Uh, and then there, there's a solution 
the amount of space that is allowed now is that much. The amount of space that they recommend is for the city of um, what they said would be 11.8 million people. And we're not there yet. Um, and and uh, that's not even the, the, that's even a higher target than I think you guys are using uh, today. Uh, but they not just recommended, they did in their maps of the city, in their formulas for FAR, down zone the city by three quarters to that number, right? So it was housing reforming zoning. Um, and uh, to come back to that idea of ubiquitous and anonymous, it was um, Frederick Ackerman, um, who is seen here in the, um, the meeting of, oops. The meeting, there he is. Behind the, the really tall guy is Howard Scott. He was the head of the technocrats. There's a meeting of te technocrats, many of whom were professors at Columbia University, uh, on the steps, I think, of the faculty club here um, in, in 1930. And um, I know how late I'm going, so I will. Yes, yeah, I will. I, um, so I, uh, I, I just need to get Ackerman's politics into the mix. Um, because I, um, hopefully you, you uh, are persuaded by that NYCHA is very low density and why they wanted to do it. But why Ackerman wanted to do it is a, is a, a very interesting story. He was close friends with Clar uh, Clarence Stein, who lived in Brooklyn on the uh, floor above them. And just to select a couple I won't subject you to, to Ackerman's own writings, um, but he railed, as Veblen did, against the price system. He, um, he criticized capitalism voluminously. I could, I could give you a hundred different quotes of long passages uh, uh, denouncing uh, the, the price system and how it impacted not just capitalism, but especially housing and the ability of workers to, to uh, and two thirds of, of the uh, country the, of the country, actually, to afford um, housing um, that could be built economically but, um, under this uh, technocratic rationale. So um, he said to uh, Stein, well, I passed Bolshevism a couple of years ago. That's, a, that's the tightest way that I could um, describe his, his politics. He was not political. Um, he, he didn't call him a social, himself a socialist. He called himself um, a, a technocrat. Um, technocrats were, uh, were engineers who were, in a way, apolitical in that they thought that engineers and rationality could solve every problem. If you could just build, just bring in a kind of utilitarian way all of the resources at hand and do it in the most um, efficient way. Um, and uh, again, Clarence Stein, um, the um, much respected architect of, of many um, housing projects and, and key figure in the Regional Plan Association of America said, last night on the floor below here, Ackerman tried to tell us, and they were good friends. Um, uh, they were probably you know, do, doing this over drinks. Uh, tried to tell us about life under technocracy. And this would not have been for the first time. This would have been 10 years into hearing the same story over and over again. Lewis Mumford called him sort of a wet blanket, um, uh, Frederick Ackerman, because uh, he kept intoning about these things. Um, so what techn uh, in technocracy, where there'd be no jobs for, for bankers and Wall Street boys or Lo Los Angeles realtors, and where each will have what he needs of, of plenty, and where a movie queen or a damn good architect will receive no more than anyone else who does his own, does his own job as well as he can, um, share in the most um, fair and uh, social, uh, socialist way. Um, so going back to those same reports, to go back to the 19. Um, 30s. Uh, I don't want to suggest that Ackerman and Ballard were the only two guys doing this. These are the technical advisory committees and the participating staff um, of the firm uh, of, with his partners, Harrison Ballard and Allen. Um, so there were a lot of people. These ideas were not just in the air. There were armies of people working on them. But if you had to find a through line um, from 1961 back to the precepts of the origins of FAR, they're clearly located in 1950 in the report that Ballard wrote. And they appear for the first time ever that I know as a historian in the reports and the analysis of zoning that Ballard did with Ackerman in 1934. So that is the through line there of how we can say um, that housing reformed zoning. So that is a shift in narrative from what I talked about before. The 1916 law clearly was passed to protect property interest by, you know, for property interest to protect um, 
sunlight, but property values um, in the buildings of the city. And that the effect of housing reforming zoning that I think we have just seen was, to, uh, was extremely consequential. It was to down zone the city by three quarters. Um, so that when we, I'm amused by the similarity of for the zoning um, uh, permit of uh, 432 Park Avenue with this bar, and the bar graph that you see there on the right. Um, uh, and, um, and in order to understand FAR, and I keep trying to explain this to, to you know, reporters and things like that, and boy, you know, they do not get it. Uh, but if you want to look at the impact of zoning, look at this model of 432 Park where you get three ages of zoning right there. You get the setback shape, you get the tower and the plaza over on the right hand side, and then you see the manipulation of FAR, which is a completely, whether you think it's egregious or not, um, in, in its uh, politics, uh, it's a, it's a um, complete innovation in the history of the skyscraper, which is why I enjoy these buildings very much. And it exists only because of the manipulation of the basic principle of FAR and the transfer of air rights. So um, this is my last slide. So if we look at what we tried to pack into this one um, uh, uh, plaque, one, one um, board in the exhibition that goes um, from the um, regulation of buildings by bulk um, to the regulation by floor area. Um, the, that evolution, that transition, which is enormous in the, dif in the conceptual difference and in the landscape of New York, um, today, from 1961 and today and every day in the future, it's FAR that are those three little words um, that shape the city. Um, and ironically, the surprising origins of that lay in housing reform, not in the property interests of um, the skyscraper builders, as is so often described um, in, the, in the, the, the literature and the narratives. And even this 1992 conference, if I were to read you the comments of Gerald, Hayden, uh, Gerald Caden and, and Bob Stern back and forth. So, um, so uh, th that, is, that is my summary. And um, the final is, is zoning, is zoning boring? So the answer is no. no. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Five, five minutes for <laughs> questions. I, um, you should tell the folks at the Skyscraper Museum to prepare for an interview. All right, great. We're open tomorrow, tomorrow noon. How exciting this is. Um, would you have time for a mm. question? Anyone have a question? No. Yes? Yes? Yes, great, great, great talk. Did Huckerman think that the city had a terminal capacity for 12 million people, or did he just sort of think that that was a handy way to think 30 years out and let someone else worry about it? I, so again, I don't, I don't think it was Ackerman per se that said, oh, you know, 12.7 million, which is the first number they came up with. They just, they want, as I, understand that they wanted to pick a number that was so big that nobody could contend with that and say, oh, that might not be enough. And, you know, clearly today we're not, we're not nearly there and we don't expect to get to 12 million. So that was a, a safe number for them to make their argument. It was still down zoning, but by three quarters. Makes sense, that yeah. It does, and I have to say, there's practically no literature on the history of FAR, but one of them is legal, um, uh, legal scholar looking at Staten Island and Richmond and that. So uh, what, what's extraordinary is how important FAR is and how little we know about it. That's why I wanted <coughs> to talk about I'll it. Send you Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, then join me in again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>